I want to thank you all for being here. <laughs> Most of you are on Zoom, so I'm, <laughs> anyway. So uh, I'm Diane Carter. I have a long history of elder care and services and fighting for staffing and care and regulation, all kinds of things. But um, most, uh, most recently, I kept getting these emails from Compassions and Choices. <laughs> and um, I opened one one day and thought, this is going to be my new job. <laughs> I, I think this is really, really so crucial to uh, really how we live and die in America. It's really, really crucial. Uh, if I use some kind of um, jargon, medical or otherwise, that you don't know what I mean by that, by all means, ask questions. And um, the other thing I just wanted to mention was the reason why I'm in elderly care, and I spent so little time in uh, hospitals and ICU and all that kind of thing, was because of my grandmother. And she was, well, now I look back and I think she was kind of crazy. But that's good. That's all a good thing. And um, she told me every time, every, you know, all the time, I love you. She told stories, she was direct, she had a very loud voice, and she cursed about everything, everything. And so I just fell in love with her because I always saw her as a truth teller. Her stories uh, seemed like she was telling me the truth. And uh, other adults, I guess, as I was growing up, they were trying to tell me the truth, I think, but uh, it didn't always work out that way, at least in my humble opinion as probably a seven or eight year old. So um, without further ado, I'm here to talk about end of life options. And this, the first part is gonna be on medical aid in dying. Slide. Um, you're, maybe you're aware that what most people in the United States prefer is that they die at home with loved ones pain and discomfort managed, and they want to know that people will respect their spiritual values. And uh, this experience in dying also reflects the values that they have around that. Next slide. Um, there's a lot of different options for in planning for end of life. And these include those things, uh, you know, the things listed here is Pursuing life-sustaining treatment, so I want to begin by saying this is all a choice. If you want to pursue this, pursue treatment and find ways to maybe try and overcome your illness, um, by all means, that should be your choice. They also, we offer, we offer an option towards um, discontinuing or refusing medical treatment, oftentimes when it just seems that it's hopeless and perhaps your medical doctor or nurse practitioner has affirmed that. Hospice is another choice, and they have all kinds of drugs and therapies that will help you um, alleviate the pain as much as possible. There's also voluntary stop stopping eating and drinking. I'm most drawn to this because of my experience with elderly and people with dementia. And um, it just seems very important to me. One in three people in America will be diagnosed with dementia. And so this is probably, I'm guessing, just about the most little known in America right now. Um, palliative sedation means that they give you a drug and you're basically... Uh, out of it, I mean, you can't feel the pain, you're not aware, you're not able to speak, um, and that also works. And then also medical aid in dying. So we're gonna start with medical aid in dying, and then I'm gonna focus on voluntary eating and drinking. Next. Uh, medical aid in dying is defined as a safe and trusted practice. The person needs to be terminally ill and have a prognosis of less than six months uh, mentally capable and over the age of 18 uh, with a prognosis, okay, six months or less. And they have the option to request from their doctor, with medical aid and dying, they'll request from their doctor a prescription of medications. 
which, uh, when they take it, they will die a peaceful death. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, there. Sorry. Whoops. There are. I can't get my voice back. There are 11 states in this country that allow medical aid in dying. Next. <coughs> Sorry. I already covered this. But the eligibility requirements are you must be an adult over 18, age, 18 years of age, terminally ill, with a prognosis of less than six months, mentally capable of making your own decisions. So this is what distinguishes you from the person with dementia. And you have to be able to ingest the medications. That doesn't mean you have to prepare the solution and deal with all that, but someone needs to hand the medication to you and you'll need to be able to take it yourself. Excuse me for a minute. <coughs> Woo. Um. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm kind of choking on my chicken here, so <laughs> you don't have to put up with the scratchy boys. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of this request, exactly depending on what happens, <clears throat> it's a lengthy process. So you have to notify your physician. And assuming he or she will go along with it and is, you know, wants to provide this kind of care, um, you have to let your doctor know, and then he has to inform you of all the decisions, or I mean of all the options. So he has to tell you about all the options I've already covered. He has to tell you your diagnosis and prognosis. He has to, and I don't mean that as he, I'll say he, she, has to, um, tell you that in all probability, if you take these medications, you will die. And so there's a whole lot of, there's a whole list of things he needs to go through with you so that you're very well informed about what you're about to decide. In the state of Colorado, and these are all Colorado requirements, you need two verbal requests separated by 15 days and one written request. And then another physician must confirm your eligibility, that must confirm that you're eligible for uh, 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 the prescription that would lead to your death. Two witnesses must testify to the voluntary nature of the individual's request. So, it's a lengthy process, and I just would like, one of the biggest issues has been that people were unaware of the process they had to follow. And so what happens is they waited too long to request the medication. Let me see if I can just pause here and get my voice back. They waited too long to request the medication. <coughs> I don't know here. Can you read your slides for you? <coughs> Would you do that? I can. I can do that. I, I'm really having trouble here. Okay, you clear your throat. Do you want me to read this one? Yeah. Okay. American Association of Suicidology, the American Association of Suicidology 
recognizes that the practice of physician aid in dying is distinct from the behavior that has been traditionally and ordinarily described as suicide, the tragic event our organization works so hard to prevent. I mean, I'll say a few things here. So I get a lot of questions about, is this euthanasia? Is this assisted suicide? <clears throat> Whew. Is this assisted suicide? Is it homicide? None of the above. In this case, a person is going to die whether they take the medication or not. And so the goal is to eliminate their suffering within the context of their values. Next slide. I have a helper here because I seem to be choking to death on stage here. Thank you so much. Um, out of 188 people who were prescribed the medication, 108 of them had various cancer diagnoses. 27 had um, ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, or other neurological disorders. 16 had cardiovascular disease, including heart failure and stroke, which many people don't know can be an extremely painful and debilitating disease. 13 had chronic lower respiratory disease, including COPD, which is also a form of basically suffocation. Thank you. Next slide. So medical aid in dying has been practiced uh, without a single incident of abuse or coercion. The issue has been, and the reason why I've seen so many fights over medical aid and dying, <clears throat> probably for my entire career, is because there have been so many concerns about abuse and coercion. And the most common thing you hear from, or I used to hear in state meetings and policy meetings was, well, you know, they're just going to kill my mother so they can get the money. I know that sounds crass, but that has been some of the societal and most of the resistance to this over time that I've heard about, in addition to the religious and other values that preclude you from doing it. Most people find that having that prescription is a comfort to them. And per the slide that G just read about, you know, the people who have received this prescription, many of them, <clears throat> but we don't know how many, don't even take the medicine. So it really is about their autonomy and their feeling that they have control of their life even as they're uh, moving towards uh, death. Um, and now I'm going to talk about dementia which is the piece that I've seen the most. And I don't know, for lack of a word, I would say I've seen a lot of bad death. And by that, I mean people who had no plan. And I'll just give you the common scenario that I've you know, seen over a career of this in nursing home, is a person progresses towards the end stages of dementia. And so what you might expect to see as a resident would be Maybe confused, wandering, you know, around the building. Fine. Um, to some degree, able to dress themselves, feed themselves, those kinds of things. And as they deteriorate, oftentimes I've seen them end up in bed in a fetal position. They can't feed themselves, dress themselves, communicate. They have no idea who their relatives are. And then, for years, they would put in a tube feeding. And that would keep the person alive over quite a period of time. And from my perspective and my values, I didn't see any excuse for that. And so, defining dementia is, and I'm going to say probably, since it's one in three Americans, most of you have had experience with this. And, you know, they progressively 
uh, lose their memory, they have difficulty thinking and reasoning, they gradually are unable to carry out the tasks of daily living, eating, dressing, um, and then they experience changes sometimes in personality, mood, and behavior. And in some instances, they can become quite violent, and then they end up sedated. We call it chemical restraint. Um, it's hard to watch. I mean, you know, they're sitting in a wheelchair, you know, I just say they're drooling in their soup. I mean, what is the purpose of life at that point? Dementia is defined in seven stages, and I'm not going to go through all of those or not tonight, but there are fairly distinct stages of what's going on for the person. Next slide. So here's what I really came to do, contrary to my lack of voice. <clears throat> So there's a book called, that's put out by Compassion and Choices, My End of Life Decisions, uh, and a, an Advanced Planning Guide and Toolkit. So let's say you know someone, like my mother has early dementia. I'm having a little trouble getting her to sign it. But anyway, we're going through it over and over again so that she understands what she's signing. And her common refrain is, oh, you know what, I want die. You're a nurse, it'll be fine. But the thing is, these are things that augment the other forms that you need when you're looking at end of life uh, decisions. The legal issues have to do with getting a medical uh, proxy or a power of attorney, a financial power of attorney, a living will, and then I encourage everybody to fill out this form. It's called the most form. M-O-S-T, it's the Colorado Medical Orders for uh, Scope of Treatment, and it has to do with your wishes. Would you like CPR? Do you not want CPR? Would you like to be tube fed or not tube fed? Would you like a trial period with a tube feeding or not? And it just goes through these, this is a legal document. It's signed by you and your doctor. This information that's in here about planning for dementia care you need to, um, you fill out this form, it's signed by witnesses, and then you would be, and it's very, uh, they're very particular questions. If I can't feed myself, do I want all the treatments available? If I don't recognize my family, do I still want all of the treatments available? Or would I prefer to let go of life at that point? Um, so you fill out this form, you get all your witnesses, it's a little bit complicated, and then you will um, attach this to your power of attorney so everyone understands what your wishes are in terms of dementia care. Quick, I'm losing my voice again, please. Thank you. I put up this slide because... Um, there's a book that was written by the CEO of Compassion and Choices called Finish Strong. And in that book, she recommends that you have the person on video saying what their wishes are so that that can be shown if any kind of healthcare provider is pushing back against what this person wanted, even though they can't speak for themselves. There's a lot of other tasks up there that you certainly want to be thinking of. Some of them Jeet will be talking about shortly, about your preferences, and then business and financial tasks. Next slide, please. Uh, there's a section of this book that's on dementia values. And the questions, uh, they sort of ask you to think very clearly about what your, prefer your preferences are, get them all down on paper so that someone could read it. And it's in preparation for filling out the form that includes all the other issues. Do you want antibiotics? Would you want dialysis? Would you want... Next slide, please. I talked a bit about advanced directives. These are the most important. Doing a living will, a medical durable power of attorney. And the thing about 
a medical power of attorney is you want to be sure that you have someone that can be assertive bordering on aggressive because when you get into an ER situation people are trying you know they everybody there has their own preferences and their ideas and you're just getting on a conveyor belt oftentimes towards you know uh, perhaps ICU and a ventilator and so you have to have the person that's going to be able to really fight strongly for your preferences. Um, it does not require a lawyer to fill out an advanced directive. You can download a, a power of attorney and fill it out that conforms with Colorado law, but I oftentimes recommend that people actually try as best they can to talk to a lawyer about it. So they've got, they've dotted the I's, they've crossed their T's, and they know exactly what will happen at the end of their life, hopefully. <laughs> if you can get all the healthcare workers, you know, flying in the same direction. Um, and it, these documents just explain what, what you would prefer. Next slide. So uh, I just, the best thing is to be proactive. I think this organization, Compassion and Choices, got me to think about what do I want? Because I've been putting off and putting off and thinking, well, I'm not at the end of my life. <laughs> the horizon's definitely shorter, but I'm not at the end of my life. And so it's really made me get front and center with this kind of information. Discuss your priorities with your family. Ensure that your doctor would be willing to participate in medical aid and dying. Don't wait. Ask your doctor. Be sure they know. Be sure they understand what's involved. Um, and then a, another thing you need to be aware of, too, is sometimes you're going to have to locate a pharmacy that will actually prescribe the medications to you because some pharmacies won't participate in this program. If you're going to be in an assisted living or a nursing home, you also need to find out, will they comply with your wishes? So these are things that people wouldn't ordinarily think about, but they're very important. And have those initial conversations with family members. And I can attest the idea that it, it has been really hard for me to talk to my mom about this topic. And I was going through this book with her, and I started to cry. And she grabbed it from me and said, oh, for goodness sakes, just give it to me. I'll read it. But then she wouldn't sign it. So we're working on it. It's a process, and it's a tough process. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Blip again. So I don't see that death is the enemy. It's certainly something I've seen a lot of. Uh, the enemy is intolerable terminal suffering and pain. And I've had, on occasion, I've had palliative doctors tell me that pain medications will uh, take care of all of the pain, and yet I've witnessed situations where it just didn't, it didn't cover it. In particular, like nerve pain is just some of the most difficult pain to treat. Uh, the only thing that matters is that you're comfortable and that whoever you're with is respecting your values and they're listening to what you're saying and they're able to go along with your values and then of course there's always room for more kindness although if you've been in the ER lately I would just say oh well um, next slide this is a quote from a woman that was 36 she had brain cancer and she had a very poor prognosis and this is her husband's quote, saying she fought so hard to live, we couldn't believe that she had to fight so hard to die. She was missing some of the papers. She understood that she had everything that she needed. She was in a small community. They ended up flying her to L.A. And even in L.A., they were looking for people that would help them out with uh, medical aid and dying. And as you, can you imagine the pain of her husband <laughs> trying to get through all this? in addition to her pain and suffering. So, next. 
and uh, this is a little bit about CompassionAndChoices.org. Everything I've talked about here you can find on the website. There are also handouts back there that you're welcome to take. If I don't have a lot of copies of this book, it's very good. And there's a postcard back there that if you just fill it out and send it in, they'll send you one of these books if you're not comfortable with just downloading the forms online. And that's a copy of the picture of the book and questions. But do we want to wait until everybody speaks? And then... No, you can fire questions to you now. Oh, okay. Yeah, please. Mary Rose has a question, and then... Do you want to give her the mic so she, oh. they can hear? No, I can talk. I okay, I'll repeat the question. They won't be able to hear. Or you will repeat it. This isn't, for, this isn't for the room. It's for okay. the... I can repeat the question. Hi, um, Rosie. So if you already have at the hospital, um, a do not resuscitate DNR on file, can you reverse that? Yes, at any time. Okay, that was it. You just would go back and get another one of these forms okay. and say, I prefer to be resuscitated. You change your answers on this? Oh, yeah, say it into the... Oh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, say I prefer, you know, at this time to be resuscitated, sign it. Your doctor has to sign this. So that's an important piece of this. Most of these documents, your doctor doesn't sign. But this one, ha it's a legal state form, and your doctor has to sign it. Good question. Are there other questions? We have a few. <clears throat> First question, how do you know that the drugs will allow for a peaceful death? Uh, will you just stop breathing? Uh, will, you, will you not be conscious? Repeat the questions. So that they can um, the question was, how do you know that this will lead to a peaceful death? Correct. And uh, what is the process of dying using the drugs. Did I paraphrase that correctly? Yeah, do you just stop breathing or do you go unconscious? You don't go unconscious, you're asleep, in a very deep sleep, and so you're not feeling any pain anymore. And in general, it's a, well, in general, you go to sleep, and you have some drugs you have at one hour. You have another drug you take at um, 30 minutes, which, uh, digoxin which interferes with your heart and how it's working and then finally you take the drugs that will kill you they're basically overdoses of, hyp of hypnotics and the other question we have here uh, as well as Judy, I believe, uh, does medicare pay for the drugs that are prescription drugs no the federal government hasn't passed a right to die act and so Medicare and Medicaid will not pay for the medications that you'll be uh, prescribed for this, uh, for medical aid and dying. And from what I understood from talking with another nurse at Denver Health, uh, the cost of the prescription for all those meds is about a uh, 800 to to $1,000. Okay. Not covered. Um, that's a, I think a question that you need to answer for yourself. I have heard from other people that um, the spouse, and I've seen it too, um, having your spouse be your power of attorney or medical power of attorney uh, can be very, <clears throat> uh, it doesn't always work because the spouse is, having, you know, so many difficulties in a very emotional spot, and they thought they could do what you wanted. I mean, because I can say that today. My husband over there, he'll do what I say. I still think he'll do what I say because he's obnoxious when he's mad. But um, sometimes if you don't have a family member or husband or wife that can get assertive bordering on aggressive, um, it can be a very big challenge for them to uh, uh, to go ahead and 
give you the medications and follow through with it. So, other, is that all the questions? I think it is. All right, Gary, you wanna go ahead? Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, well, we've been talking about a medical model, a legal model that's passed by the legislature, became law. I'm going to be talking about a non-medical model that's available for people who either are unable or unwilling to use this particular approach, the medical aid in dying. There are many people who don't either fit the criteria, aren't dying from the right diseases, and, and in the six-month period could be suffering intolerably for many, many months beyond six months. So it's for the people outside of that system that we'll, I'll be talking about mostly. Uh, so w let's go back to the basics. Uh, I think any time is a good time to talk about uh, how to die on your own terms. First of all, it's a reality, right? Nobody gets out of this world alive. Death is just as natural as birth. And I had the good fortune of living and working overseas in many different countries where that's the case today. They still consider that this is one process. Uh, the family is involved. When I was born in 1940, that's how it was here in the States, in the small town that I lived in. And uh, since then, it's become, we've created a system that Diane has dealt with and fought with for years that has taken a tremendous amount of control out of the hands of the family and of the individual. So uh, let's go to the next slide. We're talking, she said about a bad death. We're talking tonight about a good death. What is a good death, really? How do you describe it? How do you know it? How do you recognize it? And how do you make sure it happens to you? Uh, let's go to the next slide. Actually, I'm gonna try our system here. Uh, dignity, being treated with gentleness, kindness, compassion, being accepted, your decisions matter. I believe that you own your own life. Life is a gift, right? You didn't earn it, you didn't win it. You know, uh, it was given to you and if you are the owner, you should be the one to really decide what happens at the end. Nobody else. So that's a good death. Dignity, gently and painlessly. Here we go, okay, good. So, when I was born, 80% of the people died at home surrounded by loved family members maybe the pastor from the local church, uh, and so on. That was a, the way it happened. And only about 20% of them died in institutions of various kinds. Today, it's the absolute reverse of that. Today, uh, most people run the risk of dying like this poor soul, hooked up to all the tubes and wires and being kept dying. This man is not being kept living, he's being kept dying because the medical technology allows these institutions and organizations to just, um, it's, my wife, she's a little bit uh, uh, sarcastic. She says, it's just like a taxi. You keep the, 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 the numbers going as long as possible. Uh, next, here we go, okay. So how should we die? Beauty, care, respect. When the first medical aid in law was passed in about 22 years now ago in, in Oregon, the legislature insisted that a annual survey be conducted of the people going through this process and asked them basically, what bothers you about this process of dying in America? And it wasn't the pain, it wasn't the huge expenditure of money it wasn't uh, being a bother and, and, a, and a, a burden on your family. Those are all on the list. But number one, every single year so far has been loss of personal autonomy. Basically, people were saying, when I become vulnerable and I can't defend myself, other people are telling me what's gonna happen to me. 
That's the thing that bothers them. So if you want to die on your own terms, you need to be prepared. Use these uh, tools that Diane was talking about. And my organization has uh, others as well who will share with you. So um, I, I love this slide because it points out who the three pushback organizations, the usual suspects, who are opposing your right to die on your own terms. And we have the religious people who feel and often say that it's not your choice. You don't have a dog in this fight. It's up to us, it's up to the way we interpret uh, religion to tell you what to do. Uh, we have the politicians who often are representing um, powerful uh, uh, interests. Medical institutions make tons and tons, billions. I've lost count, I think it's over about uh, I won't give you the number, but you can imagine that dying is a very profit-making uh, uh, opportunity. And uh, if you are the product. <laughs> uh, and then the other is the medical institutions themselves, that they have many interests in how you die, when you die, what happens to you, what they're going to allow. The conveyor belt that Diane talked about is a real thing. And uh, it's the, uh, part of the problem is that they have vested in interests and they have rules and protocols they have to follow. And it's taken out of your hands. It's often taken out of the hands of your family members. And unless you have a strong power of attorney, the generic word for that is surrogate, someone who can stand for you, uh, then you are really um, almost a victim. You can't get off the, well, there, you can, but the end is always the same. Uh, so I love this slide for, shows us what's going on, but I hate the slide because it looks like it's me in the bed there trying to get my rights honored at the end of my life, but I'll fight to the very end. Now, the doctors are insiders. They know how this system works. They're the ones who actually, you know, sign the directives and all those kinds of things. So Stanford, uh, uh, let's look at the next slide, yeah. Stanford Medical School asked over a thousand doctors, if you're facing end of life on this situation we're talking about, how do you wanna die? And it was amazing. Look at here, 90% don't want CPR. Almost 90% don't want ventilation. Dialysis, no way. Chemotherapy, no, never. Surgery and on down, they don't want all this stuff that the conveyor belt delivers. What's wrong with this picture, folks? Huh? All they want is the drugs at the end, the palliative care to be kept from pain. And when I was giving this talk uh, in New Mexico before they passed their law, a doctor stood up and said, it's not our fault. We doctors are employees. We have to follow the protocol. And so I said, welcome on board. Would you like to become a member? <laughs> so the ethics, the doctors you know, are taught n to do no harm. And the whole uh, mindset coming out of the medical schools for all these decades is that we have to keep people alive. If they die, I failed. Also, the, the track record of the medical institution suffers if too many people die on their watch. So there's all these incentives to just keep it going, but it becomes a matter of uh, prolonging death. It's not a matter of extending life anymore. That's the issue. Here are some of the kinds of conditions that Diane was referring to that can put you in a situation where you don't have the choices. I'm on that list. I got that diagnosis, congestive heart failure. Uh, so I have a personal interest in this myself. Uh, I was uh, mentioning that I was uh, giving a, a testimony before the legislature of my state, uh, Minnesota, kind of like we're talking right now. And the next person that got up and stalked talked, 
He said, we physicians are not killers. And we cannot be put in a situation where we are ending people's lives. And if this law passes, it'll be a slippery slope and people will be killing, you know, grandma for her money or whatever, that kind of thing. And I turned to my wife and I said, Ann, that's my cardiologist standing up there. He's the guy that has to turn off the pacemaker and the defibrillator that I have in my chest. And so he and I got together and had a heart, heart to heart talk with my cardiologist. And we laughed, we had a drink. And he, I said, well, are you gonna turn this off? You know, my state, I'll, get, I'll be shocked nine times before I die if I, if I let it go on. And he said, well, I'm a devout Catholic. I went to Notre Dame. I support a, a financially support a major Catholic politician, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, are you going to turn it off or not? And he said, well, I will refer you. If, I, if my Catholic morals prevent me from doing that for you, I'll refer you to a colleague who might be able to help. So you really need to know where your doctor stands, what the medical institution, the, the hospital, what their policies are, and whether they'll even honor all these directives and so on. It, it requires a lot of personal looking up information, talking to people, and finding out facts before you decide. So how did this whole death of dignity, right to die movement start? really started in 1980. Uh, the original organization was called Hemlock Society. Many folks who have been around for years and as old as me remember that. I joined that fairly early in the early 80s, and it was the go-to place for um, uh, first, first place you could talk openly about end of life on your own terms. In uh, 2004, the organization split into two parts, the part that uh, the organization that Diane was talking about and Final Exit Network, the organization that I am uh, rep representing here. And we have, uh, we agree with each other. These laws are necessary and important, but they're not sufficient. There are quite a number of people who, in the state of uh, Colorado, even with the law, this law doesn't fit for them for a number of medical and personal reasons. So Final Exit Network, the original founders and the board members decided nationally, or it's a national organization, we need to have resources and options and information available for the people who the laws do not cover. And so it all began with this book, kind of a bombshell book. It's written by Derek uh, Humphrey, a British uh, um, journalist who had written several other books, and his, his first book was about his wife who uh, was dying from cancer, very, very painful, untreatable situation, and uh, living in London, and he helped her die, and he wrote a book about that, and that was the first uh, um, book of his, four or five books. And this one is the one that caused all the controversy because it gave, it's called uh, Final Exit, the practicalities of self-deliverance and assisted suicide for the dying. These are people who are actually facing the end of their lives. It's actual practicalities, in other words, how to, the nitty gritty details, how you can pull your own plug. And it was a, a a national, it was a New York Times bestseller for a long, long time. There are millions of copies sold in many languages. It's available in your public libraries. Uh, it's available online as an uh, e-book. I'd recommend that because you want the most uh, up-to-date information available. But uh, this is what Final Exit Network is set up to do. We have no relationship with the book. We get nothing from the book but we still believe it's an excellent resource for you to, to look at. So here's our new logo, Final Exit Network. Our vision is basically that when people are facing this intolerable, intractable, uh, end of life condition, that they should, not just in Colorado, but all over the country have the option to die peacefully and legally. 
That's a vision for the future. Our actual mission, our ongoing mission, is to provide education. We provide information, resources, options to people, very, very specific, very detailed, uh, for practical, peaceful ways to end their lives. We also have a cadre, a group of exit guides, trained people who will go out and actually provide information to you, sit with you if you want them there when you, you die. Uh, and this is all part of uh, what we do day in and day out. We often end up uh, having to defend this right. We spend lots of money over the years fighting laws in, that prevent people from having these options. So, education. We do research. We have a group of, we're all volunteers. We have a group of researchers, technical people, uh, chemists, uh, uh, other uh, people trying to do more research and finding options. Uh, we uh, have lawyers that we will send out to defend your choice if you're getting pushed back and you want uh, some free legal services to get in the face of, of uh, the institution that's uh, denying you. It gets their attention when a lawyer calls up. They're thinking, uh-oh, we're talking maybe big bucks here for some settlement or an awkward lawsuit. And it's, a, it's surprising that uh, how quickly the medical ethical committee of the hospital intervenes and says, just a minute, slow this conveyor belt down. Let's take a look at this. So that's one service that we provide. Next slide. Uh, we also deal with the dementia problem, and it is a very serious one. And uh, uh, like Compassion and Choices, Final Exit Network has a um, addendum to attach to uh, your um, advanced directive. They named it a terrible name. It's called SAD, Supplementary Advanced Directive for Dementia Directive or some such thing. But the point is that it covers basically the things that, the, uh, that you do, but it comes with free legal backup if someone or some organization is, is uh, denying your choice. Uh, and we spend a lot of time in courts around the country just fighting for the uh, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of choice on, in this area. Next slide. So how, do, how, do, how does this all work? You know, we're, we're all volunteers. We're supported entirely by our donors. We, go, we have, a, 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 like me, I'm a speaker. Uh, we have 20-some speakers around the country. We have this group of counselors who will be on the telephones with people. Um, how does this all work? Well, people contact us through the website. And uh, those of you who are here can uh, uh, get a free one-year membership which will get you uh, some additional magazines and, and information on this. You can decide whether you like it or not or whether it's worth for you. Uh, we have a volunteer group of physicians who uh, make sure that the people who are applying for this assistance and options on how to die on their own terms are medically in situations where they, in fact, it's a legitimate case. It's not some young person who's unhappy for some reason and wants to, you know, end their life. And so these physicians uh, scan and, and, and uh, look over the medical records in the application and decide whether or not they qualify according to the um, uh, conditions that we need to have to stay on the right side of the law and make sure this is all proper and legal. Um, so a guide, a guide is a person who has gone through lots of training, who will, uh, first of all, we have guides that work on the telephones. They're called coordinators. You would call up. They would consult with you as long as it takes, as many calls as you want. And basically, hundreds of people use this service just to educate themselves, get information, and feel comfortable. Only a, a small percentage of them actually say, well, I want to have these services. Most of the people have this sorted out in their own minds and hearts and know, you know what other options that they have short of this. The, the guides then are assigned to the person 
and there are two of them, and uh, they will come to your home free of charge, give you what they call an educational visit, make sure you understand all the ins and outs and the how-tos. They will come back a second time, also free of charge, to be there in the day of your self-deliverance. I hate that word. It's kind of a euphemism. I like, you know, I like real words like die and death, not, not passing on and uh, there's other euphemisms. Uh, so the uh, education is also done at no charge. Uh, next slide. Uh, I think I've said about this. We do not provide drugs, equipment, anything, physical help in doing anything. It's all education, moral support. We are there with you and for you. But you, this is a do-it-yourself thing. So you really need to know what you're doing, and we provide all the information and the moral support for you to decide what you want to do. Can, you can change your mind up to the last minute, but it really is your choice. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is a little where, my, where you go for information. Just look up uh, um, finalexitnetwork.org and you'll be given access to all these different uh, resources. I'd like to highlight the first one, the Good Death Society blog. We've had 84,000 people who have read the different blogs that are posted on there. There's, there are current blog posts, usually four or so, recent ones that have been posted. And then there's an archive on any of these subjects that you're interested in. V said, uh, voluntary uh, stopping eating and drinking, dementia, directives, anything you can think of. There are short, well-written, reader-friendly uh, posts on there that you can start to educate yourself. It's a very good resource. Um, there are two new services that we provide. Uh, one, we hired a professional trainer of what we call surrogates. These are power of attorneys who speak for you when you can't. And if you think that your spouse or a neighbor or a lawyer is not the right person, we pr provide free of charge our surrogate to get in contact with you and work with you to decide who should be your surrogate, what their powers should be, and work with the surrogate to make sure they are, how did you say, assertive up to the point of being aggressive? Yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of person. So that's a free service. And uh, the uh, second one, I guess, is the uh, Advanced Directive for Dementia. It comes with the uh, legal support. Um, we're continually looking for new ways that we can put power and control back into your hands when you face the, the end. And I think this is the end of my talk. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come back to Colorado. I lived in Boulder for many years, and I realized that uh, this town isn't Boulder, but I feel at home anyway. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Gary and Diane. Such a wealth of knowledge and education. So grateful. Um, so I have a lovely angel up here um, looking, you know, mournful too. Anyways, um, because conversations about death and dying are never easy. And I really believe to ease the journey, we have have to have power of choice for that in autonomy and that empowerment. Um, and the more you can educate yourself, the more you can get a direct care plan going and the more you can share that with your loved ones so that they know what your final wishes are. So there's one element here which we're talking heavily about is your own self-empowerment and making your own choices. But in the end, what it really comes down to as well is sharing that care plan 
with your family and your loved ones. Next slide. So um, my job as a conscious dying coach and a death doula is to educate people on all these choices. So I'm so grateful for these incredible networks and um, resources out there that people have worked for so hard to educate all of us for. And with that, there's so many choices, just like in your spirituality or your particular tradition or religion or family traditions. Um, globally, there's so many options out there. Um, so I'm going to talk about today options of your final disposition or your final options for after death care of your body. So next slide, please. So with those choices, along with choices during your dying process, you will be empowered um, to have what your belief system and um, your personal values can really pave the way for the choices you make. So number one, obviously, we all know about the traditional casket burial. And um, a pro of this is that entire funeral industries have been designed to support you and your journey around um, death and dying and care of your loved one, um, you know, care of like even beautiful caskets and placed in the ground in these gorgeous cemeteries. But I'm going to tell you the cons of some of these is that um, traditional casket burial is extremely expensive, ranging anywhere average seven to ten thousand, upwards of forty thousand dollars. So they really can bankrupt families in the end um, sometimes, and they have to take out loans. It can be a massive financial burden for families. Um, mass amounts of metal. Um, hardwoods are used from um, rainforests are used for these big sealable concrete or um, polyurethane vaults and that's to help preserve the body and also to help the graveyard look beautiful still um, once there's decomposition the vault helps maintain the level ground so um, embalming, that's a very traditional, modern way of dealing with our loved ones when they die, is actually extremely carcinogenic for the embalmers themselves. And those fluids, when they finally get an opportunity to decompose and leak and leach into the ground, which eventually they do, can really um, cause huge environmental impacts. Next slide. So we have traditional fire cremation. And um, fire cremation, this is an urn with ashes. Fire cremation is really accessible. 60% of people in the US have, um, are choosing to have flame or fire cremation. And um, it's much cheaper than a traditional casket burial and embalming, but it also carries a massive environmental impact. Um, they say your average cremation is, amounts to driving 600 miles in a car. Um, and also the heavy metals that are released into the environment and into the air can be very dangerous and very carcinogenic to surrounding communities. Next slide. So a lot of you are hearing the term green burial or natural burial. And I think this is really catching on for a lot of ways. But a green burial is really um, defined as a burial with the least amount of environmental impact and often with um, ecological restoration components that come with it in terms of restoration of the land, planting natural um, plants that grow in the area. Um, all materials are biodegradable in a natural burial. Um, sometimes all you have to do is ask your local cemetery, hey, can I have a natural burial? I don't want embalming. There's not a single law in this country that 
makes you embalm unless you're crossing state lines um, or sometimes the body has to be transported out of the country. So there's no requirement for embalming. Um, you can ask your cemetery to eliminate the vault liner. You can ask if you can just put the body in the ground in a shroud or a simple pine box. So um, even if a green burial cemetery or a conservation cemetery is not in your vicinity, you can always request, can I have a green burial? So that's really wonderful. Um, something I think is so beautiful and profound about green or natural burials is it really brings the community together um, in a very um, old traditional way of recognizing that death is a communal event and there's healing when everybody participates in the event. So it allows much more of a communal participation. Next. Human composting, really exciting, just passed in Colorado in the last year. It's an accelerated version of our natural decomposition in the ground. So it takes an average of six weeks. Um, and in the end, you basically end up with a cubic yard, which is to say, um, to fill an entire back of a pickup truck with human compost remains. Super rich soil, um, just like the compost that you would get from your local farmers or buy in the big bags, um, can be used to re-nourish the earth. Um, you can't grow commercial food in it. So that's the good news. You don't have to worry about that, about where your compost or vegetables are coming from. Um, but a wonderful way to honor your loved one by then using this earth to restore um, degraded you know, areas and environment. Next slide. So um, this is called aquamation or water cremation. Put in a vat with a solution of alkaline. Um, in a matter of about 18 hours, it's heated up a little bit in temperature. You end up um, with a, a really nutrient-rich solution that can be flushed down the drains, but preferably, once again, used to restore, um, restore the health of a land. Um, in Denver, they're using it to grow organic flowers for flower gardens, and then these cut flowers are then sold. Um, it's a really wonderful, gentle option on the environment. And it's, um, it costs about average as a flame cremation. So, okay, next one. So with all these options, it really, it leaves you in a place of um, realizing that you do have so much more choice than really what the conveyor belt gives you. Um, I think it's really exciting, and I love educating people on these options, on these end-of-life options. So a huge part of the work I do is helping people design their final end-of-life care plan, because um, it can be a very overwhelming process, sometimes scary. So I take people through a process in my coaching. I've really taken a deep dive into their personal belief systems, values, um, care plan, and then in the end, you really have something very special to gift your family with, which is your final choices. Um, you can reach me at acalljeet.com. That's A-K-A-L-J-E-E-T.com. And um, it's been an honor to be here with all of you today. So thank you very much.